Welcome, everyone. This uh, another morning in DevConf. <laughs> and uh, for the first talk today, uh, I'll be talking to you about uh, what we have been doing in, in BMW for the testing of embedded devices and what parts of that I will try uh, to bring into Debian so that other people that are developing embedded hardware can benefit from uh, whatever we are developing in-house and can try to, s uh, to use the tooling that we have and hopefully contribute to it as well. But first about me, a bit, just a bit. So I'm Igor Smachinos and I've been a Debian developer for a long, 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 long time. And uh, I've been a Python developer for almost as long. And so for the last 12 years, I've only developed in Python. Uh, in my previous work history, I worked some time for uh, Nokia doing testing for them. And then was doing some testing for the uh, UVU setup box uh, for the BBC. So that was another part of uh, embedded hardware that I was uh, helping to test to bring to market. And after DevCon 15, I joined uh, BMW Car IT, which is like a sister company of the BMW Group, uh, where all the, all the software talent is uh, con concentrated and grouped together so that we can bring the best of IT area knowledge to, to BMW processes. And since then, I've been uh, busy testing the next generation head unit for, for the BMW. Uh, so uh, let me recap a bit more, a bit from my last year's talk, where I was talking about what kind of computers are in, in, in the cars. Uh, I can be slightly more specific this time because finally the software that we have been developing is actually in cars that are going into release now and the interfaces have been shown in public. So uh, when you, when you open, get into a car right now, a modern car, you will be basically surrounded by screens. You can see some of them here. You can see a screen in the central console with the, with the map. You can see a screen just be, be behind the steering wheel with all kinds of indicators and maybe even a map if it's, uh, the car is new enough. You can see a screen on a heads-up display with another set of indicators. You can see a screen for the climate control uh, in newer cars. Uh, you can see even a screen on your, uh, on your lock, on your remote. And behind each of those screens, there's a computer, which is running software. And uh, most of those screens nowadays are uh, strong enough computers uh, be behind them that they uh, can just run almost regular kind of Linux with applications running on top of them. But that is just the tip of the iceberg, because there are far more computers inside every car. And there will be plenty more. Uh, a modern car can, can have up to 80 different computers in it. Uh, most of them are really small specialized units, like the ones that are controlling the uh, ABS, or the ones that are responsible for communicating with the, with the mobile network, so like a small modem with a built-in firewall and all kinds of security protections that then gives communications uh, interfaces to the rest of the car. Uh, there is a movement in the automotive industry to consolidate uh, these AT uh, computers into something, into a smaller number. But as soon as you consolidate, you bring up the complexity. And the more complexity you have, the more you need uh, testing to bring, to make sure that your complexity uh, doesn't break functionality. Uh, uh, another big uh, uh, impact for the, especially the car market, is the long longevity of our releases. 
For example, if uh, we would uh, start development of a new software for a car right now, if we freeze the version of every package that is going into a car right now, optimistically, that software will be actually released to the first cars in approximately two years. After that, it will take another probably four to five years for that new software to be extended to the whole range of BMW cars. After that, it will take another couple of years for that software to be released to all range of mini cars, which are using basically the same software, and another couple of years for that software to be released to a whole range of uh, uh, Rolls-Royce cars. Uh, and after that has been done, uh, you actually need to support that software that has been released for up to 25 years. So, yeah, as soon as we free software now, we need to do support, at least in the, in the, in the sense of security updates, for between 25 and maybe even 35 years. When you're looking at the, these kind of timescales, uh, you can no longer rely on people developing software now even being around at the end of the support cycle. Some of them, uh, they, will be, uh, they, will, they will go on to other things, uh, other software, probably other companies, uh, maybe even entirely different career paths. So, uh, to do the updates of 20-year-old software successfully, you need to have a lot of testing infrastructure uh, in place, a lot of automated testing infrastructure in place that will continue running and continue providing you information if, if the functionality in your cars is still working after you've updated some library with the new security patch. This brings me to uh, what we do for testing in the project called MGU, so the Media Graphics Unit. That's the computer that is behind the central console, the navigation screen, where we have the navigation, the multimedia, and configuration of your car, and all that kind of stuff. So in that, in that software project, we have 194 Git repositories where people work on the, on, the, on the software. We have 60, uh, 64 SVN repositories. We use this, those to do like binary releases. So some, some parts of the, uh, some parts of the um, software is so hard to build that uh, we don't usually build it fully from source every time. We actually build a binary release committed to SVN and then in the whole build process, we check it out from the SVN again. We have 62 meta repositories. Uh, that's representative of like domains, uh, like navigation domain, multimedia domain, security domain. Those, they are working in their own, in their own silos. And then these 62 meta repositories get integrated into one base repository as submodules, uh, which then represents the whole software release. And it contains around 11,000 packages. That's, that's uh, quite a lot for such a relatively simple device as what we have on the, on the central console in the car. We have a, a, an image that is more than a gigabyte. We have a 12 gigabytes of extra packages. Mostly that's uh, debugging information and uh, extra information that is required uh, or extra code and tooling that is required for testing. Uh, uh, four hardware variants and 30 different partitions across these variants. So each of those variations actually needs to be tested. And we do t three testing levels. So, uh, so there's a, there's a functional level inside the, inside the specific domain. So navigation domain, for example, they have like tens of thousands of 
unit tests and uh, their domain level tests that, that they do. And once those pass, that goes into a meta repository and does uh, integration level testing. And once the integration level testing passes, we gather changes from all the meta repositories into one place and do a release level testing. And when that passes, we actually create a new release that development continues on from there, from there on. At each level, the software needs to be built, images for all the variants need to be created, and build acceptance tests for every variant needs to be run and pass on both virtual and real hardware for, for the changes to be promoted up next. So every day we do this, this whole process for uh, five, uh, up to five release candidates for up to two branches. So for example, uh, there are cars that will be going into production uh, this autumn. So there's a branch that is targeting those cars. And then there are cars that will be going into production next spring. And uh, they will have slightly different feature set. So there's a separate branch tracking those changes. So we have to do uh, around 800 system builds every, day, uh, every week and 2,400 component builds approximately every week. Uh, there, are, there are more than 2,400 tests executed on each, 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 each time a uh, build is completed. So every week, more than a million 300,000 uh, 300, tests uh, are executed. There is a lot of hardware doing that. So hundreds of machines, thousands of cores, terabytes of RAM, hundreds of terabytes of storage being used for, for all of that. And uh, when all that is completed, we can create a new release. And that's, that's new and shiny. And then the real testing begins. Because when the release is completed, we Run, uh, run it through way longer testing scenarios that can take up to a week to complete. Uh, so like uh, a question being, for example, if you power on the car and leave it running for, for uh, two hours, does it go into a low power mode when it's supposed to? Um, does the target reboot uh, start from new if you if you leave a car for, for uh, several days, it's supposed to power down completely, so it doesn't drain the battery. And then when you come back, it's supposed to power up uh, really fast. So we do that kind of testing after the release is complete. And a lot of other kind of tests, because after, after my group is done with, with the software, it gets shipped to uh, several dozen uh, other groups around the world who then flash the software to real physical cars and go through testing scenarios by driving those cars. So if there is something critically wrong with that software, they would have wasted a lot of time and a lot of money if we if we pass that software on to them. So to do that kind of stuff, uh, we've developed a bunch of testing tooling in-house and what, what I want to do is to get at least the commonly useful parts of that tooling out into the public and uh, get it integrated into Debian so that every developer who does any kind of embedded development tasks can uh, either use that directly or look at that for, for inspiration for their work. This is how the end product looks like. This, uh, this is the, the, sc the screens that will be uh, going out now in the new BMW X5 and the 8 series. And yeah, so it's both, both the, the central console and the so-called combi, or the, the instrument cluster that is just behind the steering wheel. They're both uh, using the same, uh, the same applications, the same uh, graphical toolkits to, to, to produce their results. Uh, 
So uh, let me step back back in, in history and to, uh, talk to you about Autozar and Genevi. So some time ago, uh, automotive developers recognized that they've been all building very, very similar boxes that do very, very similar stuff, but every one of them has been reinventing the wheel in terms of how these boxes are built, how they talk to each other, what exactly every box is doing, so how, it, how the work is divided between the boxes. So they came together in creating the um, Autozar Consortium, where they uh, started to unify uh, standards on uh, how the devices in cars should be should be constructed, what should be the overall uh, framework, uh, the, the overall architecture, how devices should be uh, talking to each other, and uh, how the devices should be developed. There is a lot of a lot of a lot of paperwork, a lot of all kinds of standards, and uh, some of them are even useful. So I'm going to talk to you about one of them. So DLT is uh, Diagnostic Log and Trace. That's the uh, interface defined in Autozar to um, help uh, development of uh, embedded hardware. It's a way of getting uh, uh, diagnostic logging and tracing information out of the hardware. Uh, the actual implementation, so the Autozar only does like uh, specification standards. It doesn't do any, uh, any actual software. The actual software for all of this is being developed by uh, another industry group and association called Genevi. And uh, in this case, Genevi developed uh, a set of, set of tools to working with the, with the DLT. Uh, it's focused on uh, what's happening uh, with the device during its development, during its debugging. Uh, when the software is released, most of those features usually are turned off. Uh, so uh, uh, the idea is that uh, the DLT is a daemon uh, that's running on the device that is collecting uh, information from a bunch of sources, including system log, including uh, adapters that uh, would feed uh, all kinds of useful diagnostic information into the daemon. By default, the daemon uh, is supposed to store the information uh, in RAM, not actually write it anywhere on the disk so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't disturb the device being tested as much. And then when you connect to the daemon, with a, with a DLT client, it will uh, dump all the information that it has to this client. So you can get the log from the very startup of the device uh, as soon as you connect to it. And from there on, you get the incremental logging from what, what, what has been happening since then. Uh, it, uh, by, uh, when you've connected it, you are getting the basically streaming stream of the logs from the device in near real time. There's, uh, there's a bunch of tooling to get the different uh, priority levels. So uh, uh, one of the key points of structure of the DLT log is that every provider inf of information declares their application ID and the context in, into which they are logging. So there's two small textual IDs. And each of those IDs can have different logging level defined. So you can say, OK, I've connected now to the, to the device. I want the syslog to be only, a, on, show, show me only errors from syslog. But this application that I'm running that's specifically made to be dumping a lot of information into the log, I want debug level information from that. So the client that is connecting to the, to the DLT daemon can actually control which messages at which uh, debugging level it will receive. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can filter down uh, what, what you see, 
by the application ID and context ID easily. Uh, you can uh, log not only textual data, but also binary data, because uh, the log messages are defined uh, as uh, a set of variables which with types, so you can actually efficiently transfer binary data out of, out of the device. It's timestamped on the device, it's timestamped with uptime, and the DLT receiver timestamps when it received every message. Uh, and as this is an automotive thing, it's not about just the devices that can actually run Linux or com more com complex uh, hardware or software. Uh, it's also for smaller devices, so uh, smaller uh, embedded uh, chips that do not run a full operating system can still produce DOT logs. And there exist uh, specific hardware devices intended to be connected to the like, like car network and receive DLT logs from dozens of devices at the same time and writing it all down uh, onto like an SD card. So you can use such a logger on a drive and collect all the information from all the devices with synchronized timestamps. Um, the logs, uh, like uh, if you're transmitting a binary information from the, uh, from the device, you can have the binary information in the logs. And that is useful when you uh, want to get core dumps, for example. As that is one of uh, the things that is quite used. So when an application crashes, you get a core dump. And uh, sometimes the device does not really want to store a couple of hundred megabytes of a core dump. That would be disruptive. So what, it, what uh, the, the tooling around the DLT does, it takes this core dump and transmits it, transmits it through the log and erases it from the file system. So it doesn't burden the, the device anymore. Um, and a client can, uh, yeah, can, can also inject lines into, into the log, which is uh, used in testing, for example, to indicate through this log in a time synchronized manner when a test, uh, a particular test case starts and stops, which is then useful in analysis. We, uh, we use the DLT logging a lot on our devices, so uh, we can often see the cases where there's thousands of messages going out every second, and a test run can produce gigabytes of logs. Uh, naturally, when you have thousands of messages per second and gigabytes of logs, you're not going to read it as a human being. You need some tooling to help you with that. And uh, thankfully, there's some tooling provided. Uh, on a basic level, if you actually want to just read stuff and actually see what's in a log, uh, there is uh, the tool called DLT Viewer uh, that is provided by, by Genevieve. Uh, it's a GUI tool to, to open the log file, to see what, what are the messages, uh, to filter the messages by all kinds of criteria, and look into the actual like, binary data, for example. Um, but yeah, if you, have, if, you have, uh, if you want to have more automation out of that, that is not going to help you much. So uh, for that, inside BMW, uh, we've uh, written a tool uh, uh, that we call uh, uh, DLTLize. Uh, it's a f framework for uh, analyzing uh, DLT traces. It's a Python-based tool where uh, you feed a stream of uh, DLT log messages uh, through a bunch of plugins. And each plugin is responsible for uh, extracting whatever useful information it can find in this DLT log. Uh, there is, it uses uh, libdlt, which, is, uh, com which comes from Genevieve, and a Python adapter for this libdlt, which was also written in BMW, uh, to parse the logs in C and have the business logic in Python. So we can have the best of wor both worlds. Uh, I can say right now about the licenses. The uh, Genevieve uh, tooling, uh, both Genevieve tooling and uh, BMW tooling for this uh, is released under uh, Mozilla Public License version 2 plus, 
and uh, that's uh, how it's going to be uh, published in Debian as well. Um, so the plugins uh, uh, initially declare what application ID, context ID they're interested in, so that allows efficient filtering, so not every plugin gets fed like tens of millions of messages. Uh, and uh, they get uh, informed where, when the device starts up, when it shuts down, when the testing cycle actually ends, so that they can report uh, stuff when it's done. And uh, when we do analysis, the plugins uh, uh, take some information from the logs and produce output files like CSV files uh, that I'll show in an example next. And when we do testing using using this tooling, uh, we have a way, way of the, um, for, the, for the plugins to produce test results in the JUnit format so that uh, you can report pass-fail, you can say from a plugin why exactly you failed, uh, and um, uh, that way you can actually write tests on this basis. So that, again, scales up to, to the scales that we're working on, so thousands of messages uh, per second and with hundreds of plugins running. And uh, because it's use it using a separate file to store intermediate data, it doesn't, it doesn't block the logging process. So here is an example. Uh, the code is, there'll be a second slide with the code. Uh, the idea of this plugin is to take uh, information about memory usage. So we are assuming that on a device, uh, there is some kind of tool that uh, periodically uh, logs into the into DLT the um, system memory information. So mem available, mem total, buffers cached, shared, and it's just just logging that into into the DLT log, like once a second, for example. So uh, the plugin here is. Uh, in its initialization is just opening a CSV file that will be the output for the plugin and sets uh, all the all the class variables to, to their initial values. Then when devices started we see in the in the DOT log that device has been brought up. Uh, we save the lifecycle ID so by lifecycle we mean okay how many times this, uh, this device has been booted up. So that's the life cycle within the test. Life cycle zero, the first time it's up. And uh, um, then call is the, the main function which gets called every time there is a message that is map, uh, matching the filter that we have defined before as app ID and context ID. So this receives the actual message saying, oh, there is so much memory. Uh, in this in the system, so we take that, we parse it out, split by values, and just write into the CSV file whatever values we we found. So this this particular plugin doesn't doesn't do any mm, processing or analysis on the actual data. It's just taking the data and dumping it. Uh, but you can see how you can do more calculations uh, in this in this context. And uh, at the end, the report. Uh, just uh, just closes the CSV file, and uh, it does a test. So we've been during this uh, the execution. We've been uh, storing uh, minimal memory available. So what's the what's the mim minimum during the whole test run? Uh, the memory available has been, and if that is less than a gigabyte, then we add a failure test case to 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 the result. If it's if it's fine, then then it's a success by default. And uh, and there's an error message that will show up if you if you run this kind of thing in a Jenkins, you'll you'll have a result HTML XML file, so it will show up as a test failure. And on the right, you can see the output of this uh, of the script. So on the top, uh, you can see the the basically the CSV file that was produced. You can have you see the uptime time. You can see the values for all the all the memory values, and on the bottom, I just took it in OpenOffice Calc and created a graph, so we can see that uh, 
the memory available stabilizes soon after the boot up. So that's good. We don't have any major memory leaks in that, which is kind of the point, point of this particular test exercise. On top of that, what uh, I, so that was uh, about the DLTLIS tooling, about analyzing DLT logs. On top of that, uh, we want to also release uh, a test uh, run environment. So that is a bunch of tooling based on, on, on top of Nose for uh, executing tests. Uh, the idea is being that uh, you define a class that uh, controls all the aspects of your hardware device. So how do you actually power up your hardware device? Uh, what kind of modes does it have? Uh, how do you run a command on this hardware device? And then this, uh, this tooling around it uh, does a, a full cycle of testing on a device. So it sets up the test environment, starts dumping all the relevant log, log files, it prepares the target, so it's actually, it switches it to a flashing state, flashes the software, switches the back to normal running state, verifies that it actually came up, and uh, makes sure that the, like the DLT log is started, and puts into DLT uh, a message saying, setup is done, all good, let's start tests. Uh, it gathers tests, so uh, we have uh, hundreds of development teams, so we, um, we actually need to gather uh, tests uh, to be run on a device from uh, hundreds of folders, which uh, also define uh, what type of test every test is, with the meta information written on top of the test. But sometimes we don't want to fully trust that, because uh, um, we want to have more control over which test is actually considered uh, in build acceptance criteria. So we have separate file that is under control of the uh, release team that defines, okay, these tests are actually build acceptance tests and these are not. And okay, this test, this particular one test, it has been flaky lately, so we still run it, but we do not consider it, its failure to be a fatal, uh, a fatal error for the build acceptance criteria. And all that kind of uh, filtering and additional information is uh, what is happening inside this XTE framework uh, test uh, collection suit that is added on top, on top of Nose. Uh, in addition, of course, there's uh, the retrying of uh, fail tests, if that is uh, uh, useful in some cases. Uh, and uh, XTE also marks inside the DLT log, okay, now we've started this test case, then you can see what's happening with the device during the test case, and here we ended the test case. In case the target has been, well, damaged by the test in some way, if there is a crash, for example. Uh, what it does, it makes sure that we have fully received the crash dump from the target, and then uh, we usually restart the target, reboot the target, so that we bring it back to a uh, known good state before we execute the next test. Otherwise, you could have like one test cr uh, doing a crash and then 20 tests af right after it failing because they cannot connect to the target because it's down. And uh, the logic specific to a, to a target, to a device, it's encapsulated into, into Python classes, and we use the hierarchy of Python classes to define common behavior, relas related devices, related variants of devices. So we currently are using this in uh, uh, three different projects inside BMW. And during the extension from one project using this to three projects using this, we have now defined a common core of the XT that is useful to all of them. And uh, we are still we are still in process of uh, reviewing uh, what exactly from that is useful for people outside BMW. 
So it's not fully ready for open source release yet. I was hoping it will be ready by this talk, but it's, it's, it took longer than expected. And uh, when that is done, then we, that will also be uh, released as open source and packaged for Debian for, for other people to use. Uh, there are other things in this, this, this framework that uh, define how it's how it's uh, how it's working. So, this um, objects that are not uh, that are like a, a global level, a singleton object. So, uh, the target is one of those. So, uh, you can have a you can have an object and code inside of it that encapsulates all the communication with the target, encapsulates all the information about the target, such as oh, which exactly mode it has been booted on last. Like uh, take a screenshot, so you can have a function on that level to have to do that. And there is a DLT monitor thing that it's a it's a class that is running in a separate thread that is ro looking through all the DLT messages coming from the target and uh, manipulating state machines on the uh, test host side to f to indicate to tests in what state the target is. So. Is it a, like, oh, everything is fine, all the systems are running, all the s uh, services have, st have been started, or um, we are actually recovering from the crash right now? And every test can um, do, s do things like, okay, we, we've started monitoring of the, of, the, of the DLT log, then we do some kind of action, and instead of trying to figure out if the reaction of the target is good from like screenshots, we can actually uh, make uh, the software on the target log into DLT information about its current state. And then we can, in the test, see if that state has been reached from the DLT log. So that makes the automation of the testing much easier. And in parallel to test execution, what XT also does is it runs the DLT lies on the DLT file so that you get the live analysis of uh, whatever logs you get from the target. So you, as soon as the execution is over, you already have the results from that as well. Here is an example uh, target setup that we have. So we have a target device and a test host. Uh, the idea is that target device is fully isolated from the rest of the world. It only communicates with the test host uh, through Ethernet, CAN, serial, whatever, whatever else is there. And uh, then the test host decides if he wants to forward whatever request the device does. So in that way, you can, uh, if your device, for example, uh, connects to a service to get information about updates, you can intercept that from tests and provide uh, uh, fake, uh, fake update information to test that, that kind of functionality. And uh, for power control, we use uh, uh, Arduino with very simple software inside of it, uh, power relay, so we can just switch off power of the device. We also use that, that particular setup of the, with the Arduino and the relay to trigger buttons on devices, to connect and disconnect USB uh, devices. So we just have a like a USB plug, which has a couple of things soldered onto it, uh, soldered onto it. So if we bridge them, then the USB device is live, and we disconnect them. It's offline. It's disconnected. So that way we can control these things from from software. And then this whole uh, this whole structure runs, and it produces you a set of reports of what is the what is the state of the of the of the target right now. What I uh, uh, what I what I wanted to do with this is uh, to get as much uh, interesting value from inside the Debian uh, inside inside the BMW into Debian, into the wider open source community. Like, like in every company, uh, there's naturally a bunch, of, a bunch of code, a bunch of software that is like 
really specific to what we do. And uh, some of it that people are not even proud of being written, but it had to be written. But then there are things that are useful and that uh, will also be useful to others. I think this is uh, one of them, and I think there are more of them uh, hidden inside BMW, hidden inside other companies. And uh, so I've gotten the, the permissions to release this, this software with the idea that maybe other, other companies, other people will be, will be using this. And if it's good and useful, maybe they'll also start contributing back some changes to it. And if that, that particular avenue is successful, then it will be far easier for me to convince management to uh, release uh, other parts of tooling that might be useful to others. Uh, therefore, the, uh, my request to you is to, to look at this and to figure out maybe it's something that could be useful for you, maybe not only in embedded devices. Uh, you could try seeing if this could be useful to, to test uh, like cloud server instances or other types of systems and uh, see how that goes. Uh, as I do not have a full running setup right now uh, to, to, to show you as a hardware setup, I, I will be writing a set of uh, blog posts uh, later on, uh, also uh, aggregated on Planet Debian, to show exactly how, how to create an example uh, a test setup using something like a Raspberry Pi as a target device. Uh, and uh, that, will, that will be the thing that, that will show you more step-by-step step how to use this thing. Eventually, my uh, goal is to have this fully packaged in Debian so that you could just take a Debian system, install a couple of packages, and have a, uh, an environment to be able to test your hardware. So that is it. And any questions? There are microphones in front of that. Yep, just keep running. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about um, uh, you uh, maintain the packages and uh, you, uh, I mean you freeze the packages and then try to release the packages, right? Mm -hmm. If there's a, something like a security issue and mm -hmm. then you have to update your package. Yep. So uh, how do you define your uh, testing coverage to make sure it is not too big or too small? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a big and philosophical problem. On uh, so when you do, especially it's like security release. How, how much do you test, and what's what's happening with the with the packages there? Uh, basically, we, when when we do a release of software, it goes through all the testing, that w that we have, and both automated and manual testing in actual testing cars. So. That does mean that uh, releasing something as a uh, security release would, would take a while. Uh, if there is a critical problem, there are ways to uh, disable functionality in cars really fast. So there's coding on the cars uh, that uh, de determines what functions are enabled and disabled. And that can be rolled out really fast to disable a function. And then later on, maybe in a couple of weeks, you can release a, uh, an update that makes that function fixed and then re-enables it. So there are, there are ways to do that. But it also depends on the, on, the, on, the security, on the software update functionality actually working fine, which has not been the case before in the cars. Has not been real focus for the cars. Thank okay. you. Thank you. More questions? No? I'll then show you something. So here is a, it's this way. Here's a DLT viewer. It's currently connected to my laptop. 
so my laptop is, well, it's Ubuntu, but yeah, kind of kind of Debianish. Uh, but the idea is that we have a DLT daemon running on this laptop that uh, gets uh, some information from it with the default uh, tools that are included and is logging a bunch of information into the DLT log. Uh, we have and says journal, we actually have information from from system uh, from system log from system D, and so every message that gets logged there will also be transmitted to the to the uh, to the DLT log. There's a, that's a separate plugin which of, with with a bunch of configuration to it. So what information you're pro uh, putting into there, under what app ID context ID and all that that kind of settings. And here as proc, there's a tool called uh, DPL KPI, so key performance indicators. And it's logging all kinds of information from proc about uh, load of the system, what processes are running, how much CPU time and memory have these processes been using in the last second. Uh, so that's dumping a lot of performance related information into the DLT log which you can then again pick up and analyze with, uh, with DLT lice to figure out what's, what's happening on your device during test. And uh, uh, currently in DLT lice release, there are no plugins to analyze this particular bits of information because we internally have a different tool that does similar things. But uh, that's one of the things that uh, I also intend to write so that you can have a useful analysis of this default process logging as well to figure out. That's it. Yeah. I have a general question. So yes. suppose I want to buy a car with a like a free software operating system and which one would be the best in the market? Uh, a car system that can be hackable uh, unfortunately, I do not think that will be ever a thing. Uh, yes. Uh, the, th the problem is that uh, in many jurisdictions, it's actually uh, prohibited by law to sell cars to customers with uh, modifiable software. Uh, it's required uh, that the software on the car, that the whole components of the car, including the software, are actually pass uh, in, uh, pass uh, verification, pass certification by the government authorities and uh, certification, parts of certification require that no uncertified software can be installed. So, <laughs> yes, uh, unfortunately that's the, the way it's, it's forced. The idea is so, so that uh, the cars on the road do not uh, cause trouble for other people. Uh, on the same roads. So it's not about you being harmed by the car that you've hacked, but about other people being harmed by the car you've hacked for yourself. Yeah. We are basically out of time, unfortunately. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be around to answer all your questions in the, in the hallways. And so far, thank you.